All right guys, so today's video is gonna be a little bit different than usual. Because I film a lot of my videos in our ambulance supply room, I figured this would be a unique opportunity to build a home first aid kit with you guys, and then you can learn my philosophy of what goes into these kits and put one together for yourself. So I know I've been pretty bad at these video series and I have this tendency of saying I'm going to do multiple videos, uh, the assessment series for one, which I'm still getting to by the way. But uh, for this one I want this to be a two or three part series where today's video we'll talk about a home first aid kit and then we'll put one together about your car first aid kit and then we'll take a look at what your on body or backpack first aid kit might have in it. So stay tuned for those, I'll try to get those released in a timely manner. So I divide my first aid kits into a couple different uh, categories. So for one, I have my core contents, and that's gonna be basically what's the same in all of my kits, the things that I feel are vital no matter where I am, what I'm doing. Then I have my uh, like serious items, and these will change based on what the need of this particular kit is. I have my minor items, and then I have what medications I'm gonna include in this kit. So for a home kit and for any kit, my core contents is always gonna start out with a tourniquet. Um, you know, I, every time I put out a video about a tourniquet, somebody ends up messaging saying, hey, what about the RATS tourniquet? What about the uh, SWAT-T? What about the um, rapid application, something else? Uh, unless it is approved by TCCC, I would not use it um, as your primary tourniquet. Now you can use the SWAT-T and these other tourniquets for backups if you want, because I know they are a lot cheaper and budget is a thing that's uh, at the forefront of a lot of people's minds. However, these tourniquets, the CAT, the Soft T Wide, and the EMT tourniquet are the only three that have been approved by the American College of Surgeons and have been shown to work effectively in high stress situations. So I would always have at least one of these three tourniquets in your kit, if not a couple of them. So the tourniquet is kind of your base and I would always start all kits out with your tourniquet. The second thing I'd make sure I have in every kit is some uh, Z-fold gauze, gauze that can be used to pack a junctional hemorrhage. Now I should mention that I've got a video detailing how to pack a junctional hemorrhage and then how to use a tourniquet as well. So if you want, you can check those out to kind of learn how to do these two skills. So these are also very important. And these are fairly multi-use as well. They can be used as a pressure bandage, they can be used as kind of a four by four to absorb blood, whatever it might be, but their primary use should be packing wounds. All right, the third must have item in this kit that kind of goes along with your wound packing supplies are going to be some kind of pressure bandage. Now these are emergency trauma dressings from North American Rescue. It really doesn't matter what brand you're using, if you're using um, H&H or something else. These all were, will work pretty well. Um, I've got a video talking about the Olay's dressing and comparing them to these. There's also the Israeli dressing, they're all great. And these will be used to control that bleeding that might not be life-threatening but needs to be controlled uh, relatively soon or it'll be used to secure um, wound pack into that junctional hemorrhage or that junctional wound um, after you get that bleeding controlled. So these are also very important to have. These are also very uh, handy for head wounds. You know, scalp lacerations bleed a lot, and it's, these are really great to wrap around the head and get that pressure on there so they're not bleeding too much um, and making a mess, if nothing else. All right, the fourth thing I would have in your core is going to be chest seals. Um, once again, there's a lot of brands of these. It's not as important to pick the right brand with chest seals as it is with tourniquets, but there are some more reputable brands than others. Um, I'm using the Hyphen. These are the compact chest seals. These both have vents in them, uh, work pretty well, and I would always recommend you have at least two chest seals for an entry wound and an exit wound uh, on the chest. And then um, the other thing I would make sure you have is a NPA, and I'm a little bit, you know, you don't necessarily need this. Uh, I would always put them in there because I'm trained in it. Uh, you know, they're not hard to learn. It's a good way to secure, not secure an airway, but to clear an airway, make sure you have a direct path of communication from the outside of the nose um, to the pharynx, and they work fairly well. So 
I would recommend having an NPA in your core kit as well, um, but if you decided not to put this in because you're not comfortable inserting it, I'd think that would be acceptable as well. The final thing, well, kind of, um, one of the final things is going to be a CPR mask. I opt not to use a CPR mask, and I've talked to people in the comments about this a little bit. I'll use a bag valve mask generally, which is what I have here. We don't actually even have CPR masks in this room, so I don't even have one to show you. Um, but basically, that's going to be a barrier that you can put over a patient's mouth, uh, and that will allow you to give them rescue breaths during CPR in your 30 to 2, or to breathe for them while they're in respiratory arrest, so if they're not breathing but they do have a pulse. What I tell a lot of people is that uh, doing rescue breaths during CPR isn't really something that's taught a whole lot anymore, uh, at least for bystanders. It's far better just to push on the chest at a rate of at least 100 uh, compressions a minute, and that's going to give them almost as good of an outcome as if you were giving rescue breaths at 30 and 2. Now, why, why I still will carry a CPR mask or a BVM in a kit is because if somebody's in respiratory arrest, whether that's from a head injury, uh, overdose, or something else, then that gives me the, the ability to breathe for them for a period of time until more help can get there. So I would definitely have some kind of CPR mask um, or something to respirate for that patient in your core kit. Lastly, and oh my gosh, you guys have called me on this a couple times when I forget to mention them or don't have them in a kit, is uh, you should have some PPE, so personal, personal protective equipment. Um, so generally this is going to consist of gloves. You can also put on like some safety glasses or something if you're concerned. But I would make sure you have some kind of PPE in your kit so you're not getting blood on your hands and potentially contaminating yourself or others. All right, so moving on from the core kit, I want to move on to more of the serious issues um, that might not be as life-threatening um, as some of these, but are still something you're going to have to take care of in the home environment. So with this set of equipment, I'm thinking more about what specifically am I worried is going to happen in my home? What do I need to be prepared to treat? And generally at home, that's going to be uh, little accidents here and there. If you have kids, um, or maybe not even kids, if you're on ladders or working or active, you know, you're going to be looking at broken bones. Um, you know, minor lacerations, uh, you know, scrapes, burns, bruises, that kind of thing. So I want to have a, a plethora of equipment that can take care of that. So starting out the serious section, I'm going to just have some roller gauze of some kind. Uh, this is really multi-purpose. It can be used to wrap wounds. It can be used to wrap on a splint, which we'll talk about later. It can even be used for packing um, in certain situations. And it's just an all-around good thing to have. So I always have at least two things of roller gauze uh, in whatever kit I have. To go along with the roller gauze, um, I'm going to have a SAM splint. This is usually what I'll use. It's just a really uh, compact, foldable splint that can be used on pretty much any extremity. It's not perfect, but it is a pretty good form factor, and I think this is the best of both worlds, and you're not sacrificing a lot of room for this. You know, this way, you know, if you have a kid or somebody else breaks their arm, their leg, you can splint that up, and depending on the pain level and what you're comfortable with, you could, in theory, take them to the hospital instead of having to call an ambulance um, and stabilize that injury beforehand, which will uh, reduce further orthopedic injury. I do have a video on splinting that you can check out as well. Um, additionally, something else that can be secured uh, with that roller gauze we were talking about, I'd get a big abdominal trauma dressing of some sort. This is just a huge absorbent pad. It can be placed on you know, an evisceration. It can be placed, uh, even this one can be placed on burns, um, something like that. So more of a massive injury if it's you know, scalding water or something like that. Uh, this is really multi-purpose. And that kind of goes into the next thing that I don't have a specific burn dressing that we use on the ambulance. We use saran wrap a lot of the time, to tell you the truth. But I would have something that can treat burns um, in your first aid kit because that is pretty common injury at home. You know, you have scalding water or, you know, burn on the stove, especially if you have kids. So uh, for a burn dressing, you want something that's not going to leave fibers in that burn, um, that's not going to, you know, stick as they try to peel it off, causing more tissue damage. Uh, and I believe this is one that will uh, accomplish that as well. This will also be good for your abdominal wounds. You know, you can put this over uh, the abdomen, keep uh, organisms from getting in and just kind of protect it as you wait for further help. So I'd always have some kind of big trauma dressing in your kit. Uh, beyond that, 
I would have uh, saline flush of some sort. It can be sterile water, it can be saline, just something for wound uh, cleaning or eye irrigation, something like that. So, you know, you have a kid, they fall, they stumble, they have, you know, rocks and scrapes up and down their leg. This is good to kind of rinse that wound out, get the gross contaminants off of that. Same with, uh, you know, something in their eye. It's good to have something that you can drain into their eye, rinse that out with. Um, and, and this will be pretty useful. So these are just uh, IV flushes we have. We also have canisters of normal saline we'll use on scene periodically. Going along with that eye injury, I'll carry an eye shield. Generally, you want to carry two. Um, you know, this will go over their eye if they injure it. It keeps it closed, keeps them from looking around. Uh, we'll reduce some pain and some panic associated with that, and then we'll reduce uh, any further injury. So I would get an eye shield. This is the North American Rescue cheap one. You can get them from anywhere. It doesn't really matter. And I almost forgot to mention, um, I would carry two triangular bandages, also known as cravats. These are very multi-use, um, and they'll be used to do a sling and a swath. If you have to splint somebody's arm, they can be used as uh, dressings, pressure dressings, if you've used the other ones. Uh, they've got a lot of uses, so I'd carry at least two of these in whatever kits you have. Uh, and then tape. Um, tape has a lot of different purposes. You know, get something that's pretty thick, that's pretty easy to tear with your hand, uh, not something that you need to cut with scissors. This will be very useful for you, whether that's securing a dressing or, um, you know, what have you. All right, last but not least in this section, I'd carry a pair of trauma shears. It'll just let you um, cut off clothing. You know, if it's an orthopedic injury especially, they're not going to want to pull their arm out of that. Um, you know, I can speak from experience. I dislocated my shoulder last year in a, in a uh, motorcycle accident, and they were trying to get my motorcycle jacket off, and I eventually just told them, no, just cut it. So something like that, you know, if your kid falls, breaks her arm, and I'm sorry, I'm kind of harping on, you know, kids getting injured. Um, that's kind of where my mind goes to with a home first aid kit. But, you know, it, this could be, you know, your partner or some, somebody else uh, around your house as well, or even just a contractor that falls off your roof. Uh, so I'm sorry I keep on going back to the kids. But trauma shears uh, will reduce pain. They'll be able to expose injury sites um, without aggravating a patient too much. So I'd recommend getting a cheap pair of these. They don't have to be premium for this because you're not going to be whipping out your home first aid kit all the time. This isn't something that you're using as part of a job. This is something that you're using uh, you know, just once in a while if uh, something happens in your home. So hopefully you're not using this that much. Okay, so now moving into your uh, minor wounds and issues. We'll move these off to the side. You know, these are completely non-life-threatening things. So, you know, obviously the first thing that comes to mind is make sure you have some Band-Aids. Um, you know, just get some various size and shapes. They're, you know, something you're gonna use probably a lot. Uh, so I'm not too concerned what you get. Just get something that'll work for you. So I'd also recommend getting some tampons. I don't have any in the supply room. We don't give them out on the ambulance. Um, but you know, for the unexpected uh, period at your house or you know, a severe nosebleed, they work pretty well. Do not use tampons to pack bullet holes. That's a very common misconception. Maybe I'll do a video on that in the future. But uh, just take my word on that. Don't use tampons to pack wounds. Uh, the other thing I rec recommend getting is tweezers. Um, once again, I don't have any on me. Um, but I'd get some tweezers to pull splinters out, uh, anything like that. It, it would be a good idea to have in your first aid kit. All right, the last section of this video and the last part of your kit that I would consider implementing is going to be medications. Um, I've had a lot of questions about what medications you should put in your home first aid kit. So for your home medications, I would start with your over-the-counter pills. Um, so I would always have, I've got a couple of these, make sure I'm showing you the right thing, um, Tylenol is, you know, it's a painkiller. Um, it's a good thing to have on hand uh, for your headaches, your bumps, bruises, things like that. I would also make sure you have ibuprofen. Um, ibuprofen and Tylenol can be used interchangeably. So if you have somebody that's, you know, really sick, you can take some ibuprofen, wait two hours, take some Tylenol, um, and then their doses are gonna overlap and you don't have periods where the medication's no longer working, but you can't take anymore. So I'd really use these in conjunction. Just be aware that any NSAID, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen, will slightly increase the chance of bleeding. So be careful using ibuprofen in more severe trauma cases. 
The uh, other over-the-counter medication that I would consider getting is some aspirin. Um, aspirin, one, can be used as a painkiller, but two, if you have somebody experiencing chest pain, um, you know, cardiac symptoms like that, uh, you can give them 325 milligrams of aspirin, have them chew it up, uh, and that's going to help them down the road. So I'd always recommend carrying some aspirin as well. But um, just like the ibuprofen, aspirin will make them bleed uh, slightly more. That being said, common misconception with aspirin is that it's a blood thinner. It's actually not. It's an antiplatelet and doesn't actually um, thin the blood like, say, Coumadin uh, would. I would also consider uh, carrying some diphenhydramine. So this is your Benadryl. It'll be good for your minor contact dermatitis, so uh, things like poison ivy, rashes, um, things of that nature. And that's also good for allergies. And um, I wouldn't recommend doing it regularly, but can be used as a sleep aid as well. Uh, so if somebody is like really sick or something and they can't get to sleep, Benadryl isn't a bad option for you there. So I'd get some Benadryl. I would also look at getting some Tums. I have these in kind of a janky wrapper, but you can get the entire kit. It's whatever you want to put it in. And then the last kind of set of things I would consider for this are going to be um, antibiotic ointment, uh, wound cleaning. You know, you don't want to go crazy with your triple antibiotic ointment. Uh, you know, I got some comments in the last video, oh, you shouldn't be using antibiotics that much, which is true. However, there's certain situations, say, you know, your cat bites you, um, you know, rusty fence cuts you, something like that, where you're going to want to put some kind of antibiotic ointment on that wound. So I would always have the antibiotic ointment. Um, and then you can have some bacitracin as well for your more minor uh, cuts, stings, things like that. You can put that on the Band-Aid and then put that over the wound. Uh, and last but not least, you know, hydrocortisone, anti-itch cream of some kind. Uh, it could make somebody's life just a little bit easier after they get um, stung by a bee or have some poison ivy on them, whatever it might be. One thing that I completely forgot to mention when it comes to medications uh, for your home kit is going to be any prescribed rescue medications. So that might be an EpiPen. If somebody in your household is anaphylactically allergic to some substance, it may be a rescue inhaler for asthmatics, or it might be something like glucagon, um, which is an injection for diabetics if they go hypoglycemic. If you have somebody in your household that is diagnosed uh, with an issue that does have some kind of rescue medication, I would highly recommend getting an extra of that and putting it in your home first aid kit, not just up in your medication cabinet. So that's the main equipment that I'd put in my home first aid kit. I know a lot of people are gonna comment, say, hey, you know, I'd put in a pulse oximeter, I'd put in, um, you know, these diagnostic equipment. I'm looking at this more from the layperson's perspective where you're not going to be getting a pulse and a blood pressure on somebody. You're going to be seeing a symptom or a wound and you're going to be treating that and you're not going to be delving too deep into the pathophys of that patient um, going further. You know, obviously if you are trained in advanced first aid or uh, have higher certifications, you can always put more into this kit, but I think this is a decent kit for your average layperson. As far as bags uh, that you can put this in, don't get too hung up on what you're gonna put this in. You know, obviously you wanna make sure that the tourniquet and the major bleeding control stuff is very easily accessible, but everything else, even into a backpack that has some internal compartments will be just fine. You don't need to buy a super fancy wall mount kit or a super fancy aid bag, anything like that. If that's something you wanna do, obviously there's a lot of bags out there that will make your life a little bit easier as far as organization goes but I really don't think it's a super necessary step to take. If you think I forgot anything in this kit, and I guarantee you I forgot something in this kit, uh, leave it in the comments down below. Um, you know, like I said in previous videos, I always enjoy hearing from you guys, uh, and I like learning from your suggestions. Before I did this video, I kind of reached out to other people in my department and got their take on what they would carry in their kit, and we kind of came to these as a consensus. But that's not to say there's not something that we should have put in here that we didn't. Like I said, this is video one in hopefully a three-part series. I'll get those videos out in the near future and I'll try to do better uh, with following up with those video requests. I, I've got a lot of requests from you guys and I'm trying to get to them, um, you know, just pumping out videos as much as I can. So, uh, you know, if you think I forgot about you, I didn't. I've got a big running list of all the videos I need to do, uh, but it just might be a little bit before I can get to them. So I appreciate you guys watching and I will see you next week. Yeah.